What is going on YouTube? Andrew Miller from HookMeadLines.com joining you here today. Uh, we're going back a little bit late or a little bit later than we usually do for a post-game reaction video. Um, usually have either Tark or Shane with me, but uh, one of the solo video today. But I did want to give some thoughts, analysis, um, and then kind of look forward kind of what's next for the Longhorns. Um, Talking Texas basketball after their big 72-67 win over Creighton. Texas stays undefeated on the season, moves to 6-0, and 5-0 uh, and at home. Um, they had another really electric game at the Moody Center last night, another really good atmosphere um, at the new arena. It is proving to be a major home court advantage for Texas that they didn't really have in recent years at the Irwin Center. So that, I mean, that's been huge. You don't have two top, well, two top seven wins at the Moody Center for the Longhorns. Um, going back to November 16th when they beat Gonzaga by, I believe, 19 points. Um, and then last night by five points against Creighton. Um, you know, heading into the game, well, here, first, um, just going to kind of give some of my initial thoughts, starting with that. Um, this Creighton team, I, I figured they would be very formidable coming into the game. My final score prediction was Texas 77, Creighton 75. Um, so I thought Creighton was going to cover the spread, and they did because the pre-game or pre-tip spread, I believe, was Texas by six and a half or seven, somewhere in that range. So either way, Creighton did cover. Um, but you know, Creighton was a team that, like, while they were having a really difficult time, not to mention the Longhorns were too, getting their shot going in in the first half and throughout a good portion of the second half, at least in the early stages, um, they fought the entire way. Texas was never really able to get like a sustained, like kind of a sustained run going that is separated enough to put Creighton away, kind of like Texas did against Gonzaga, um, which is a testament to just how good that Creighton starting five is, that they were able to kind of keep things close, keep things just competitive and gritty for so much of the game. I believe every Creighton starter played Yep, every Creighton starter played at least 33 minutes, between 33 and 36. So they continue to be workhorses for this team. Usually when you're logging that level of minutes, you start to see maybe some foul trouble, some wear and tear on the team. But they're a very disciplined team that plays very good fundamental basketball. I know a lot of people have heard this about Creighton a lot, but it is true. I mean, you didn't really have anyone from Creighton getting in foul trouble yesterday. You had Shireman and Alexander each with three, but I mean, none of the and none of the bigs really were getting in foul trouble. I think Kaluma might have gotten in some trouble a little bit early in the game, but he ended up being a major factor in the second half, so that didn't really end up playing a role. Um, so anyway, it like I said, th that starting five, I was I was worried about it coming into the game, and that, that was a worry for a reason, because that Creighton starting five is one of the best in the entire country. That, that kind of goes without saying. Um, for Texas, I mean, I, I thought that the bench, like the, the advantage Texas had with their bench depth would end up playing a role here if Texas could end up getting a lead early, and it did. Um, I mean, Texas's bench, because I, man... Creighton's bench had zero points on the night, so um, obviously the bar was not too high for Texas's bench. But uh, Christian Christian Bishop had an had an impact on this game. I figured he would, given that he was facing his former team. He was a Creighton transfer two year, or, uh, well, yeah, a little more than a year ago. Um, but he finishes with six points, a few re yeah, four rebounds. Do you have any blocks or anything on the night? I don't think so. But he, I mean, he was good when when he was needed or when Texas needed him to be. Um, once again, you're getting some contributions off the bench from Jabari Rice and Brock Cunningham. This was not the best game for Jabari Rice, I will say. Um, he was, I believe, two for nine shooting from the field. I did my studs and duds as I do after every game. I'll link that below. But my dud for the Longhorns was Jabari Rice. That is the first time this season he has fallen that category. And while he did make some contributions, otherwise had two big blocks, four rebounds, only turned the ball over once. But, I mean, he was sh shooting two of nine from the field, one of six from deep. And he had some open looks, especially from deep. So uh, he, he was not – this was not his best game offensively. But, again, he was still sparking the offense more so than anyone was off of uh, Creighton's bench. And he was still making contributions defensively. Uh, was playing very good help defense. 
um, played a big role in limiting what Creighton was able to do um, within about 10 feet from the basket, which is an area they're usually pretty potent. Um, helped a lot with Ryan Kalkbrenner, who still gave the Longhorns some difficulties down low. But um, in terms of holding him to just four free throws, and I believe somewhere in the – what do you end up with? Let's see here. I mean, 13 rebounds, so yeah. But, like, limiting the amount of touches that he really got in the paint that were close to the basket, easy buckets, um, helping on those double teams. And then um, also defending Shireman on the wing. Uh, he did a nice job of that. Um, but the starting five for Texas was fantastic. Um, I, I really, really liked what Texas was getting, again, out of – um, Marcus Carr and Tyrese Hunter, again, not the best game for them offensively, but there weren't a whole lot of guards in this game that were, that were really in a rhythm, really until Ryan Nemhart got going in the second half. Um, Marcus Carr finished up 35% shooting on 20 attempts. You never really want to see that at that volume, but if he's going to be shooting at that volume, at least he went 40% from three, finished up with a team high 19 points. He didn't turn the ball over, and that was the biggest thing for me. He was one of my studs for the game, and that's because he finished the game five rebounds, five assists, no turnovers. Yes, he might have been 720 shooting from the, from the field. He only got to the free throw line once, which, given the amount of contact he was drawing, I had a little bit of an issue with that because Creighton was getting to the line a lot more. Usually, Carr ends up getting a little bit more respect from the refs, but just not in this game. Um, but yeah, he was he was good. 19 points. It uh, Yeah. He's been, he's been really good for the Longhorns this season, leading the team, actually second on the team in scoring, I do believe. Um, and even though it was an off night for Hunter, um, in terms of, you know, his, at least most of the way his shooting efficiencies from deep, he was pretty efficient still from the field, finished up the game, 47% shooting from the field, 7-15, um, one of four from beyond the arc, didn't get to the free throw line either, oh, sorry, Marcus Carr got to the line three, did he get to the line three times? I'll have to confirm that later. Uh, sorry about that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Hunter, he, he had some contributions, and he was pretty good. It was nice to see him come back on the floor, I will say, after injuring his, it looked like an ankle injury, maybe a knee. Um, he had to get helped off the floor. It didn't look like his, is that his right leg? Left leg, left leg, I believe, actually. It looks like he was having some issues, but then I remember looking over at the bench at one point in the second half. He's not there after he was getting worked on by the training staff. And then next thing you know, he's getting ready to go back in the game and had a pretty good finish, especially defensively. He was good defensively in this game, at least most of the way. I mean, you consider a lower body injury, he was pretty disruptive on the perimeter, had one steal that led to a break or that led to uh, a break in transition. And then, um, yeah, I mean, again, most of the way gave Nemhart some troubles. Um, when he was matched up with someone like Trey Alexander, he was, he was holding up well on the perimeter and then... Uh, again, obviously, Texas was doing a nice job limiting whatever or any chances that Creighton tried to get with, with some of their bench guys, uh, namely Francisco Farabella. He, I believe he is a former TCU transfer, had a dozen minutes off the bench, but wound up going, I believe it was 0 of 4, 0 of 3 from the field. So um, he was often matched up on either Hunter or Marcus Carr. So uh, nice to see there. Um, the biggest thing I did want to mention for Texas was that Timmy Allen finally finally had a big game. He had, a, I believe it was a season-high 11 points. Uh, he was 50% shooting from the field. Um, and then took one attempt from beyond the arc, but ended up missing on that. Uh, but definitely his most efficient offensive game so far. Uh, ended up with seven rebounds, I believe four offensive boards. Four assists, one turnover. So, I mean, this was by far the most impactful game of the season for Allen. He tremendously or dramatically slow start out of the gates for him. And I was hoping to see him get going here soon in a big game. Um, I believe it was that a couple games ago. Maybe it was Houston Christian. He had another double digit scoring game this season where I was hoping that would kind of be a launch pad for him. And it ended up slumping through the last couple games and. You know, this uh, a solid double-digit scoring night, seven rebounds, getting going on the offensive class, making all sorts of offensive contributions. This is the sort of game that can get Timmy Allen's confidence where it needs to be so that he can, you know, really help this team throughout the rest of the non-conference play. You know, we got number 16, Illinois, coming up in the next game next week. So he'll be much needed. 
Um, not to mention when Texas starts all conference play in, in a few weeks here. So um, great to see him get going. Um, last thing, I want to give a shout out to Dylan Mitchell, Dylan DeSue. Um, while they weren't blowing anyone away all on the score sheet, they were very efficient in this game. Both had BPMs north of four um, and net, po- I believe, positive net ratings each way for the night. Um, also both uh, contributing in terms of just rebounds holding up defensively. Uh, Dylan Mitchell, I had reposted a couple videos on Twitter, and uh, he was he was really solid against Kaluma or Shireman, whoever he was matching up with on the winger at the four. Um, he was, if you take a look at the film, he, he was really solid defensively, playing really good one-on-one defense. Um, so I, I'm trying to think what else, you know, if there's anything else to say about the game. Uh... It would be nice to see Texas get, you know, get some stronger, just get some stronger closeouts when you have a team like Creighton on the brink with some guys that have logged heavy minutes. Um, you know, maybe pick up the tempo a little bit in the final, like, five minutes. Get some better shots, get some cleaner looks. The problem was that neither team was shooting cleanly from the floor, to say the very least. I mean, Baylor Shireman has been a tremendous three-point shooter the last few seasons, including this year since he transferred in from South Dakota State. This was the worst performance I've seen from him in a while. He ended up going 3 of 13 from beyond the arc, and I believe each of those three makes came within the final five minutes. He finally got going at the end, which was keeping Creighton in the game, but he was cold for most of the night. Um, the same could be said for Arthur Kalumo, 1 of 5 from beyond the arc, Ryan Nemhart 0 of 4 from beyond the arc. Again, Nemhard ended up getting going in the second half. But if not for those strong late runs from Nemhard and uh, from Nemhard and Shireman, Creighton would have been put away, I think, with four or five minutes to go. So, but you can't always rely on a team that's usually a good shooting team that's got a, such a strong starting five, such as Creighton, to just fade away. So, to, to either degree here, it was nice to see Texas get a gritty win this way. I had mentioned heading into this game that this was one of my concerns, was that if Texas does get in a close game, they really haven't played a close game yet this season. If you look back at it, their their closest game scoring margin-wise was actually against UTEP in the opener. Yes, Tyrese Hunter took over that game when it mattered, and Texas closed out. I believe it ended up being a 15-point win, 15 or 16-point win, and... You you kind of worry about that when you're heading to, when you're facing a team like Creighton that's had some close games that they had to grind out recently. You know they had a two point loss to Arizona that could have gone either way. Um, impressive wins against Arkansas and Texas Tech, two top twenty five teams in the Maui Invitational. So to see Texas rally the way they did and close out the way they did, at least to secure the win, was was big for me and. Um, It's something that they can hang their hat on moving forward. You know, again, I had mentioned you got Illinois coming up next, which I will preview here in a moment just really quick because we will end up doing a more in-depth preview of the Illinois game in a few days here. But, um, you know, you now have a few wins under your belt where, you know, you've gotten in your rhythm. You've built up confidence. You've shown that you can beat some good teams. Um, You know, Gonzaga, a really good team, and you beat them by almost 20 points. At the same time, you've now beaten number seven Creighton in one that you really had to grind it out. You had to face an experienced, well-rounded, and just all-around strong starting five. And you were able to come out with a five-point win. The question now lies, can you do it either at a neutral site or on the road? Texas has to travel now to face Illinois. I believe this is the Jimmy Classic. I would need to confirm that. But um, I believe this game is in New York City at MSG. Um, and it, this might be one of the tougher environments that Texas has played in so far. Again, I know it's a neutral site, but I would imagine the fans are going to be split pretty evenly here. Um, and it, you know, Illinois is a team that, similar to Creighton, has a lot of experience and a lot of proven guys. Illinois, though, has more depth. They have, they, they go nine, ten guys deep. And they have some faces that are pretty familiar to Texas. Um, Brad Underwood brought in some transfers that have had a major impact. Um, while he hasn't gotten off to the strongest start, and he's not getting as many minutes as he did at Baylor, Matthew Mayer, um, the six foot nine guard slash wing that a lot of you are probably familiar with, um, he's still he's he's still making contributions, averaging about seven and five a game, but 
we know what he can do when he starts heating up. But I mean, someone like that that is essentially being a role player this year shows you how much depth Illinois has. Um, the the biggest or at least the most impactful player for them so far is definitely the Texas Tech transfer, Terrence Shannon. Um, he's averaging just shy of 20 a game, uh, one of the leaders in the Big Ten, if not leading in scoring right now in that conference. Um, he's off to a red-hot start. And again, he's someone that's played the Longhorns multiple times before, I believe for at least one year. He, like, he was recruited by Beard, by his staff at Tech. I believe played for him on, or played under him for one season. But again, some of these guys are familiar with with Texas, and this is an Illinois team that is pretty deep, pretty experienced, and at a neutral site, this is a new. This is going to be a new test for the Longhorns. So, this is really the last major one before you get into conference play. If you if you pass this test, Texas has a very valid argument to be the number one team in the country. In fact, I think they probably should be if they end up beating Illinois. So. Um, I, I, I don't know what my score prediction for that game is going to be yet. I will give this Creighton win another like couple days to soak in. And, you know, um, we, we got a couple articles coming in the next few days here. Um, and I dive into what Texas has done so far and what lies ahead. Uh, talking about some of the guys off to hot starts. I'm going to have one up today that is diving deep into some of the guys off to hot starts in the first half dozen games. But overall, Texas has looked great to start the season. This is another big win against another top 10 team. Uh, Moody Center has proven to be a huge asset for Texas in terms of home court advantage. Multiple guys that are gelling well together. Dylan Mitchell making an immediate impact. Serge Barry Rice making an immediate impact. Timmy Allen finally getting going against Creighton. There's a lot of things to be excited about with this team right now. Um, but yeah, anyway, like I said, we'll, we'll be coming back with a video here in the next few days previewing uh, the Illinois game more in depth and then talking about some football stuff as well. But uh, and for me, Andrew Miller with HopeInHeadlines.com. That's pretty much it.